Hi y'all. In this video I'm going to respond to Dr. Moriarty who did a collaboration video with Christy Winters et al. and then did a response video to some of the feedback he got and uh, so I've watched both and I thought I would just respond to some points. So uh, Dr. Moriarty I would just like to point out from the outset uh, the way that you present yourself on the camera when you talk to people and the way you do that you come off as very condescending which I don't mind. I'm going to address the merits of your argument. I just want to put you on notice that you're very off-putting to a lot of people. Even when you're explaining stuff you're very excited about that's not related to political stuff. You just have that very contemptuous, condescending kind of tone. I do too. I have a lot of contempt for uh, the people, the feminist types, the social justice warrior types, uh, and I don't mind showing it. The difference between us seems to be that I'm aware that I come off as condescending. Uh, so anyway, you spent a, a lot of time talking about uh, rationality and logic, very condescending. You guys think that, uh, you're so rational and so logical and so reasonable, but you need to realize that there's a wider body of scientific information you need to look at, so you can't just go look at one study, you know, that kind of uh, shit. You have just confused, um, in that entire segment, um, conjunction and substitution. There's no logical problem, there's no rational problem with uh, a person having a logically valid, sound argument that also has emotion in it so long as the emotion is not used as a replacement for the logical argument. So don't confuse the conjunction of two things with the substitution of the one thing for the other. I have a lot of passion. It sometimes comes out when I argue. That does not mean that I allow my passion to be a substitute for a logically valid argument. I used to have this math professor who would sometimes weep when doing proofs because they were just so elegant. The fact that he was emotional and it really got him choked up to look at such beautiful mathematics did not detract from his ability to write a logically valid proof. So don't confuse the one with the other. So you talk about, uh, my notes here, science, scope of survey of reading, oh, how people, um, what was it, looking at just one study is not enough, you need to go around and look at more, the wider body, blah, blah, blah. This objection from you will have some force when I see you taking to task the people on your side who will pick one study and, and pretend as though that has proved their point without, without a reaching through this wider body of knowledge. And also, this is more of your condescending tone. You presume that those of us who disagree with your, uh, with your dogma do it because we're retarded. We're just too stupid to understand science, and if only we were as bright as you and as educated as you, which, curiously enough, the people you did the collaboration video with, video with don't have an education in a proper science like you do, but for some reason, you jump in with them. But anyway, that it's we who just lack the knowledge. Suck it, bitch. Um, <clears throat> it is simply not true. When a person proposes an argument and they advert to one study uh, to short that argument, all, I'm, all I re uh, am required to do in that exchange is show that the study they have proposed fails to uh, prove or fails to um, support what it is they claim that the study supports. Typically, this is done by undermining the study by pointing out that it's flawed in some uh, very obvious and very uh, you know, some fatal kind of way, for example, goofy uh, sample size, or it's not a random sample; it is a cherry-picked sample, or you know, uh, just bad mathematics, which happens a lot in social so-called sciences. Um, like the uh, oh, I won't go into it. I've done anyway. So the next thing I wrote here is negative one twelve. Even roots of negative numbers, complex numbers, division by zero is undefined. Oh, right. Okay. Um, Number File some years ago did a video uh, lying to people, claiming that if you have an infinite, uh, if you sum up all the numbers from uh, you know, 1 to infinity, what you get out is negative 12. This is just a lie. They knew that it was false when they said it. They said it anyway. Lawrence Krauss goes around talking about it all this time. If you add it all up, it just it equals negative 112. And if you don't like that, it's too bad. No, it doesn't. In the mathematical community, when Number File did that video, said, "No, that's not actually true. This is wrong." And indeed, the math that the so-called, the supposed math that you put in there is misleading people. And you can look in the comment section, people you know, writing things like, "Today I learned," or "My mind is blown." Well, your mind should be blown. You were being shined on. These people were misleading you. They knew that what they were saying wasn't true. They were just trying to shortcut it to, to, I don't know, I guess in some kind of pedagogical tool or whatever. Lying to people is not a pedagogical tool. Now. Um, 
the even roots of negative numbers bit is when teaching roots, you know, taking the square root of a negative number, you can't do it. That's true in respect of what the person knows at the time, because they don't know about complex numbers. Later on, they get introduced to complex numbers, you can say, now this general rule that you had in the real numbers has some exceptions here because of the complex numbers, and here is how this works. But it's still true with respect to what the person knew at the time. You still can't do it with real numbers. You need another piece of mathematics that uh, wasn't, uh, well, that you learn later. So too with the division of uh, division by zero always being undefined. That's not true. Uh, it's, it, it is true with respect to what the student will know at the time they're taught this. It is not universally true. For example, if you relax some of the non-logical axioms of Euclidean geometry, you can get projective geometry, where division by zero is in fact defined. There is a point at infinity that is defined as a division by zero, and the relaxation of the so-called parallel postulate lets you um, have a state of affairs where all parallel lines meet. They all intersect with each other at some point. Saying that, as a, saying that when you're trying to teach a person the general rule of Euclidean geometry would only be confusing the person. So you don't tell them when you're teaching them Euclidean geometry that later on, if you, if you, if you go into non-Euclidean geometry, you're going to run into a different set of axioms, of not, well, a different set of axioms that will allow you to do different things. So this won't generalize to uh, that state of affairs. You keep it uh, in the context of the subject you're actually teaching. That's quite a bit different than going before uh, people and saying other, other kinds of things that you know not to be true. Like, for example, if you add up all the numbers from you know, 1 to infinity, you get negative 1 12th. It's just a lie. My side of the argument on that, the mathematical side, says no. You're shining people on. You are nowhere to be seen and saying, hey feminists, you guys are corrupting science. Hey feminists, you guys are manufacturing your data. Hey scientists, you're telling, or social so-called scientists, you're saying things that are just false and here's how you know. If you took a logic class, you would see this. If you knew a little bit about statistics, you would notice this problem. Nowhere to be found is you or any of your friends uh, in, in that conversation. Nevertheless, there you sit in your video saying that it's we on my side who need to have another thing. We're the ones who need the education. Uh, and then you try the, uh, the old nice bait and switch of you're a social justice warrior too. I advocate for all manner of justice. I am not a social justice warrior. A social justice warrior, the term social justice warrior does not mean anyone who advocates for social justice. It, it refers to a particular kind of people, deceptive people, uh, you know, like leftists, who want to, to essentially put on a cloak of, oh look, I'm all meek and mild, love and light, while doing the most corrupt, uh, the most corruptible, the most corrupt kinds of things in the service of their pet political ideology, it's also no, we also call it the regre regressive left. Uh, a well-known, very far left guy, Jerry Coyne, who is generally honest, uh, rails against the regressive left too. But when his little pet issue comes up, he lies just as quickly as the rest of the regressive left will lie. Uh, his particular pet issue is uh, gun control. No study, no matter how dishonest, is, uh, is too poorly done for Jerry Coyne to endorse it, to include when it's done by a known fraud, a guy who uh, failed college, he, he couldn't pass university, got kicked out, and then later got a, a professorship because of his political advocacy. And they're like, oh, he's a professor. And this guy, when he does his uh, studies, his studies about how gun control does in fact reduce crimes, what he does is just changes the criteria for what will count as a crime. So he can say that, well, before this, it was this, and then after, after the ban was put in, it's now this, QED. No, all you did is you said, well, if you have four before, it counts, and if you have six afterwards, it, or five afterwards, it, it doesn't count. So you've changed the number. You have changed the background conditions. This all is going somewhere, by the way. Uh, also, you responded about, I, you called her Jeans, I don't know her real name, uh, or how to pronounce her name either. Uh, Jeans' response about people on the left, and uh, she said something like, people on the left, or people on the right are more likely to have facts and evidence or whatever it was than people on the left, and you took exception to that. Uh, I agree that, that that is an empirical claim. It requires evidence to support that it is, in fact, more of one than the other. But on the point you addressed about how you hang out with some of the, you work with some of the smartest people around, the fact that they're smart and they're trained in science, in, in physics or mathematics or chemistry or whatever it is, doesn't mean that they apply that same analytic skill, that same analytic talent and training, to the social so-called scientists, and indeed, I think you and I are both going to agree that kind of what passes for rigor in the social so-called sciences would get you laughed at at any mathematics convention, at any phys uh, physics convention. You just cannot get away with that kind of shit in uh, the natural sciences, in the real, the actual sciences. Um, now, the Christy Winters thing, when I was first sent a link to her, I thought, well, maybe this is a feminist who actually has something interesting to say, and she'll have good research, and uh, 
I doubted it, but I'll, you know, I'll keep an open mind and go in. And every time she opens her mouth, she's uh, she's saying something that's either untrue, well, that is untrue, or she's distorting uh, the, the way that you go about analyzing things. So here here is her from, um, what was the comment she left on one of my videos? Uh, they vote for their MEPs, which you know about because you live in, in England. Uh, that is direct representation. Ergo, Sargon is a moron for comparing the non-representation of English colonists to the Ameri uh, and, and the Americans, presumably she meant in the Americas, to the Brits who elected freaking Nigel Farage and others to be their direct representatives in the EU. My response to that was, MEP's votes aren't weighted and the system is therefore not, quote, direct representation, end quote. They use proportional representation. I can see you're really getting your money's worth out of that PhD in government, doctor, more particularly. I can see she's really getting our money's worth out of her education. So that's that's her field, politics. And she doesn't know the difference between a direct representation and, and the proportional one. This does not bespeak competence. So anyway, uh, she did a video proving that the patriarchy exists, evidence that the patriarchy exists. And all she managed to prove in that video is that she doesn't understand st statistics or logic, and she's willing, or to the extent that she does, she's willing to deceive people. So my response was, I'm not remotely persuaded that any such thing as, quote, the patriarchy, end quote, exists. I've not seen a single logically valid argument which results in the conclusion, therefore the patriarchy exists, or that one does exist is what I actually wrote. I'm at this section of your video in which you're defining your terms, patriarchy and egalitarianism. The, ag the egalitarian definition is peculiar in relation to your null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is not logically connected to that definition of egalitarianism because there's nothing implied about any sex-differentiated distribution of positions in an elected political organization that is necessitated by the proposition that people have equal standing in terms of political power and influence. Or influence, I should say. Because that's what I wrote. Political power isn't the number of people who hold political office in a democratic system. The weight of a ballot cast is the unit of political power. And each particular woman has a vote that counts equal to each particular man. The distribution of people who hold office is a consequence of the political power and influence of the aggregate ballots cast by individual men and individual women voting, where each vote counts exactly equal to every other particular vote. As I noted earlier, no argument pro proposed, of which I'm aware, that purports to demonstrate the existence of this so-called patriarchy is a logically valid argument. There is nothing logically dubious about the following states of affairs. 1. A patriarchy exists and all elected members of government are women. 2. A patriarchy exists and all elected members of government are men. 3. No patriarchy exists and all elected members of government are women. 4. No patriarchy exists and all elected members of government are men. 5. Either of the aforementioned propositions in which any other sex distribution of elected members exists. So 80% men, 20% women, whatever it is. Inasmuch as these other states of affairs are perfectly plausible, knowing the distribution of positions of elected members of government can't logically arbitrate among those propositions. As one would expect, when the question to be tested, uh, when the questions to be tested are poorly defined ab initio, whatever data you derive in an effort to test it will be of no utility. That is to say that, the, that given that any and every distribution of men as compared to women who hold elected position is consistent with the null hypothesis, finding any particular distribution of people who hold elected office can say nothing, and will in fact say nothing, about the null hypothesis. And then a parenthetical, the null hypothesis deals with political power influence in the political positions, which is the ballot box. It doesn't say anything about the actual holding of the office. See if your definition of egalitarianism. Since elected officials are by definition non-randomly selected, the distribution, whatever it is, doesn't lend itself to being a good null hypothesis candidate. For that, you requires a condition that the thing to be considered as a null hypothesis is the way it is by chance alone. If you're engaged in the business of asking the question, by chance alone, what would this look like were this distribution under the null hypothesis, you shoot yourself in the foot by choosing a non-random process as that null hypothesis. In a non-random system, you shouldn't expect to find what you should find where names were drawn randomly from a hat. If we chose our elected officials for the bully by means of sortition, you'd have been able to have the null hypothesis that you do have, and then you'd be able to say that, if you got mostly males chosen over many trials, there is a bias in favor of males. That would, at least on its face, support the alternative hypothesis, hypothesis that there's a patriarchy. But this isn't Athens, and we don't choose our representatives by sortition. Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, her response, this is, it's very erudite, very uh, scholarly, I, I repeat myself, <laughs> and she shows here her, ac her academic chops. If you're not persuaded by reality as it is reflected in the basic facts, that we have nothing to talk about. That's her response to a logician's explanation, a mathematician's explanation, of why the logical structure of her argument is invalid. 
She apparently is so stupid as to believe that you can have mutually implicit propositions as the null and alternative hypothesis, and then derive something intelligent. What you need to have are absolute dichotomies. The, one, the truth of the one absolutely guarantees the falsity of the other. They both can be false, but they both cannot simultaneously be true. She has proposed a null and an alternative hypothesis where they both can simultaneously be true, therefore knowing the truth of one says nothing whatever about the other, and even if you could, even, even if you, you could get something sensible out of that, the absolute most that she could prove is that the effect that we see in, in the legislature, because this is what uh, hypothesis testing looks for ultimately, is that it's not, that uh, whether or not it's done randomly. Well, of course it's not done randomly. We don't toss coins to vote for, elect, uh, uh, for various representatives. People make choices on who they like over who they don't like. So the, the absolute most she could prove is that our elections aren't done by chance. But we already knew that going into it, because this is not ancient Athens, this is not the bully, and uh, we don't do it by sortition, which is just drawing names from a hat. There you would be able to prove very easily that there is a bias against women because they were not allowed, their names were not allowed to be in the hat. So you, over many trials you would notice, gosh, we keep getting all men. Do you think there's something amiss here? Well, of course there is. Women are excluded. So any proposition that that anyone is free to be in, in the, the uh, pool of candidates from which the name can be selected would be uh, stating a falsehood, and you could prove it statistically. But in our system, that isn't how it's done. People choose to put themselves up for office, and then people look at all the possible candidates and choose the one they like the best, or the better, depending on how many there are. So she is just log she's logically vacuous. She doesn't understand st statistics, or to the extent that she does, she's depending on her audiences being ignorant such that she can tell these, these outright falsities and have them accepted as truth. Now here's the wedge strategy uh, that I'm going to employ with you, Dr. Moriarty. You want to whine and complain that it's we on my side who are just too stupid to understand science, and if only we had a bit of an education, we'd be able to appreciate the great wisdom that comes from the grand poobahs of the social so-called social so science community. Which studies do you have in mind that you are willing to put your reputation on the line to say, this is the bee's knees. This is these, this or these is or are the studies, study or studies, that really prove the proposition. These are the proof in the pudding, and I'm willing to stake my reputation on it. Because if you tried some of this shit in your physics writings, you would be laughed out of the community as a fraud and a charlatan. You'd be the next uh, Shell Drake. So please put your reputation on the line as a professional physicist to say that this social science study, these studies here, or whatever it is, these are the real deal, and I'm willing to throw my reputation away if I am incorrect. Or if, or if the research is uh, dishonest or whatever. Which one are you willing to, throw, to, put your, uh, to put your neck on the line for? My guess is none of it. And the reason for that is what I alluded to earlier. The rigor that is required in actual science is nothing like what you can get away with doing in social so-called sciences, where you can make shit up and say the most absolutely stupid things all day long and be applauded for it. For example, I intentionally kept the sample size small so as not to, so as not to bias the study in favor of a, of a false positive. The, this is the kind of understanding of statistics that is common in the social so-called sciences. It would get you laughed at for being a fraud, a charlatan, an, an inept, incompetent piece of shit who needs to be uh, you know, driven out on a rail from, from the uh, community of scientists. The fact that most scientists lean to the left and are willing to tolerate this kind of shit does not actually indicate that they're being intelligent. All it indicates is that it's perfectly possible for, uh, for, for people to have two standards for what they'll accept. One for their work, and then one for, well, these are our stupid red-headed uh, stepchildren, and we'll let them get away with things that I would not let me get away with, and my colleagues would definitely not let me get away with, in my field. But, you know, it's too much to expect for these stupid people over there, so we'll just call it science and it'll be good. Have a great day there, Professor.